Hi everyone, welcome back to my channel, h &E Life. My name is Dr. Cindy Wong, and I am a practicing GI pathologist. So today I will pick up on my Pathology 101 series, and thus far I have gone over normal histology of the entire GI tract from esophagus to anus, and I have also covered very common abnormal diagnostic entities you can see in the esophagus, stomach, and small bowel. So all that is left now is commonly seen abnormalities in the colon. Most of the diagnoses that could be made in the colon are benign diagnoses. And today I'm just gonna cover a portion of it, which will be colon polyps. It is something that as any pathologist or resident can see, it's if you rotate on GI service, it's gonna be the majority of what you see. And today, in terms of colon polyps, I am going to cover some of the more common ones, and I'll toss in a few cute ones that I personally really like. So today, I'll cover hyperplastic polyps, tubular adenomas, mucosal prolapse polyps, sessile serrated polyps, and traditional serrated adenoma. Let's just get started. So what you see on the screen right now is an example of a colon biopsy. Of course, everything I'm going to give you is endoscopy, saw a polyp, and they excised it, and now we're looking at it. So we have a colon polyp, and this is a very good for the classical features for a hyperplastic polyp. So let's zoom in. Features of a hyperplastic polyp is basically you have tubular dilation of the crypts, and you also commonly see surface epithelium that's really, it kind of looks like there's just too much epithelium and it's giving this frilly appearance. And between that and the dilations where you see here and here, you also would have some serrations. And when I say serrations, it's basically when you have a lumen that's not nice and circle. So this is a nice and circular lumen. But in addition to this, you also have kind of jaggedy looks to it. So like this and this and jaggedy here. And then similarly, here's a completely different polyp, but also it's a hyperplastic polyp. You can see the similar features, the abundance growth of the surface epithelium. And usually it's very mature where you see abundance of goblet cells. And then the other feature you will see is along, once again, you'll have dilations and you have serrations. So you see here, this is nice serrations going each way. And this is something that's completely benign. It happens to people as you get older and it doesn't have much significant implications for cancer. All right, so that is hyperplastic polyp. Let's move on to the second most commonly seen polyp in the GI tract, which is a tubular adenoma. Similar thing, you can develop as you age tubular adenomas, and it does not have any implication that you'll for sure progress to colon cancer. In terms of tubular adenomas, people could get them as they progress and age. So when you look at a tubular adenoma, by definition, tubular adenoma has low-grade dysplastic surface. So here we have some background normal-looking glands. You can see that the nuclei are, are very basally located. They're kind of... Uh, columnar to sometimes cuboidal if they have a lot of mucin and it kind of squishes it down. And they're not that big. The chromatin is kind of pale. And then we move here and then we see this stuff. And just by looking at it, you could just say, yeah, this is a tubular anoma because overall it just looks significantly darker and uglier than the normal area. And so what makes something low-grade dysplasia? So low-grade dysplasia in comparison to the normal, you can see that the nuclei are enlarged. So if you look at this nuclei, right, this one thing is a huge, it's a whole nuclei. And then you compare it to a nuclei here, it is almost double or triple the size. And in addition to in enlarged cells, they also tend to be pseudostratified. So when you have these cells and they kind of push up on each other because there's just so many nuclei, they kind of make a pseudostratified look. So basically, this is a nuclei and this nuclei up here. It's not because it's stratified. It's not because this is actually on another level. This is just squeezed by these two cells and here's the rest of the cytoplasm of that cell and the nuclei is just so happen on top and then you move here and you have this nuclei for this cell and then this one and then you have nuclei here where like the cytoplasm is squeezed and that's why it's on the surface so that's a great definition of pseudostratification and as well you have hyperchromasia so compared to down here um 
compared to over here where you have these kind of normal looking cells, like I said, they're generally pale. When you come back to the areas of, um, of low grade dysplasia, the cells sometimes become darker and that, that's where the hyperchromasia comes from. And finally, you have this changes extending all the way to the surface. So here's the dysplastic change and here it is, dysplastic change. It goes all the way around and dysplastic change does appear. So once it reaches the surface, then it's truly completely low-grade dysplasia. Now that we're on a topic of tubular adenomas, <clears throat> so colon adenomas have three phenotypes as you can call it. There is the plain old tubular adenoma, and then there is the tubular villus adenoma, and then there's the pure villus adenoma. So what diagnostic criteria makes it which one? So tubular adenoma is when you have greater than 75% of your whole polyp or whole adenoma volume occupied by just regular tubules. This used to be a crypt, and now this is a crypt that's been replaced with low-grade dysplasia. And then when it is basically 75% to 100% of the adenoma volume, then it's a tubular adenoma. Tubular villus adenoma and a villus adenoma basically, as the name suggests, will have villiform appearance. And to be called a pure villus adenoma, you have to have greater than 75% adenoma to have the villus features. So what makes a good villus feature? So this is a great villus feature. That's a great villi. This is a eh villi. And then you have another one, you have another one. So if your if your entire polyp is covered by that, then you could call it a, a villus adenoma. It's villus form greater than 75%. And anything in between basically 75% tubules to 25% tubules or between 75% villus and 25% villus, then anything between that category is considered a tubular villus adenoma. And uh, to be honest with you, a pure villus adenoma is very rare because they're generally really, really large. And it's by the time it becomes a pure villus adenoma, it has such high risk of becoming uh, malignant that most commonly, if that was the case, you will see the associated intramucosal or adenocarcinoma associated with it. So like I pointed out here, you have some villiform structures. And then as you scooch around, you kind of have more villiform structures. And overall, by the appearance of this, and then if you look here, the villi are not not properly oriented, but most of this looks like villiform, and then you have more villiform architecture here. So this definitely is greater than 25% of the entire polyp. So therefore, this meets the diagnostic criteria of at least tubular villus adenoma, but does it meet enough criteria to be villus adenoma? I don't think so. Look at the rest of this stuff. That's all tubular. And then a Aside from the surface, you have areas that doesn't have great villiform uh, formation, like here and here. So this will be just limited to a tubular villus adenoma. A villus adenoma will basically, if the whole uh, adenoma looks like this area, then you could call it a villus adenoma. But clearly, we cannot meet that threshold with this example only. Now, aside from hyperplastic polyps and tubular adenomas or tubular villus adenomas, those are the, basically the most commonly seen polyps with actual abnormality in it. Oftentimes, we'll get polyps uh, where it's basically, the clinician says it's a diminutive or a one millimeter or two millimeter polyp, and you get the specimen, it looks just like normal colon. And then what are you going to say about it? It's basically, it's not a polyp. They, it, they just saw something that looks like a polyp but truly isn't and then a lot of places do it differently i've seen places call that stuff polypoi colonic mucosa what we call it here is benign mucosal excrescence and some places would just plain out call uh, colonic mucosa with uh, no significant abnormality we have other kinds of abnormalities you can see in the polyp that gives a definition but has absolutely no malignant potential so here is a great example of this this is a prolapsed polyp. This is a polyp that you'll get commonly in the rectum and sigmoid colon. And you look at this and they call this a polyp. And of course, it looks like a polyp. You know, here's some base and here is this polyp. And then you start to look, the surface has a little frilliness to it. Maybe the surface kind of, it looks dark maybe, but at the same time, you can see it's mucin depleted. 
but it's not quite um, in the area where it's not cramped like this. You can see that they're kind of just side by side. It's not truly dysplastic in any way. And the true feature we see that is really causing this polyp, it's the hypertrophy of the muscular mucosae and how it's basically going in to the polyp itself. So you can see here, here's a bundle of smooth muscle. And then you can see that this bundles of smooth muscles kind of go up and in between the crypts. And what this happens is this is basically called prolapse features. And because of the extreme prolapse features, this overall polyp, even though it might have some features of hyperplastic, would just be called a mucosal prolapse polyp. And these, like I said, once again, they're completely, completely benign, and they are commonly in areas where you're more prone to prolapse changes, such as, you know, diverticuli. So these are very limited to the left side of the colon and specifically to the lower left side of the colon in the rectum sigmoid colon. All right, I think I'll stop my video here. This has been quite a long video, and I talked about a lot of things. And next time, I will talk more about serrated polyps of the colon, of course, other than hyperplastic polyp, which I've already said this time. Okay, well, that's it for me here. Please like and subscribe and hit that notification button and everything that the YouTube algorithm likes to see a channel do. All right, so I will see everyone next time. Bye.